Starbreeze Studios, a Swedish game developer and publisher with several highly successful titles under their belt, including, but not limited to, Dead by Daylight, Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, and of course, the ever-popular Payday 2. Their motto is, live and die by gameplay, perhaps a fitting mentality given their current financial status. This is the story of how Starbreeze Studios went from a success story on the back of record profits, to filing for reconstruction, police investigations, and being ordered to cease all development on their latest this title overkills The Walking Dead. Before we begin, I wish to be clear about something. This is not an entire chronological history of Starbreeze as a company. I'm only going to be touching on events I consider relevant to the announcement, development, release, and eventual failure of Overkill's The Walking Dead. As such, while Starbreeze was founded in the late 90s, our story begins in 2012. After varying success with multiple titles, Starbreeze was looking for new opportunities to claim their stake in the world of gaming, not to mention make enough money to keep the lights on, as they already had their massive ups and downs. Their sights landed on Overkill Software, a nearly bankrupt studio founded in Sweden by Simon Vickland, and brothers Bo and Ulf Andersson. They had very few resources, but the desire to make entertaining games nonetheless. They were trying to gather resources to develop a sequel to their bank-robbing first-person shooter, Payday the Heist. The game had a pretty reasonable following, but not enough to fund future projects without outside help. Thus, Overkill Software was integrated into Starbreeze Studios. While in the public eye, this was merely a standard developer pub publisher relationship, in reality the two companies became effectively inseparable at this point. Starbreeze is Overkill, and Overkill is Starbreeze. Working as one company, Starbreeze and Overkill set out to develop Payday 2, and turned to 505 Games to handle publishing. All things considered, this was a massive gamble for both companies. They pooled pretty much everything they had together to fund Payday 2, and if it didn't deliver, that very well could have been the end for both businesses. However, it seems any prayers that may have been made were answered. In August 23rd, Payday 2 was released to massive acclaim. The game exceeded development costs purely on pre-orders, and only became more profitable as time went on. Constant paid DLC packs to generate more revenue, accented by free content to please the crowd, made Payday 2 the massive success Overkill wished it to be critically, and Starbreeze economically. A few years later, Starbreeze would buy the publishing rights back from 505, making Payday Starbreeze's most successful product ever released. At this point, Starbreeze had the outreach and finances to do pretty much anything they wanted to. Bo Anderson, formerly one of the three core founders of Overkill, became the CEO of Starbreeze. Bo's mentality was to efficiently innovate. He wanted to spearhead new ideas for games, and potentially even more, as quickly as possible. He was particularly fond of collaborations with other developers, all in the name of cross-promotion and, to put it simply, street cred. Payday 2's extensive list of official crossovers more than proves this, and what better opportunity to try something new, stretch the bounds of new technology, then partnering with an IP with the massive outreach of Robert Kirkman's The Walking Dead. After more than a month of teasers building up ambiguous hype, in August 2014, Overkill Software, officially under Starbreeze, announced Overkill's The Walking Dead, a cooperative first-person shooter based on the smash hit comic and TV series. The game would be a survival horror, taking ideas from games like Left 4 Dead, Destiny, and the company's very own Payday franchise. Reception was mixed, many fans were expecting content for Payday 2, or at least some kind of tangible content to be released on the horizon. Instead, they got the announcement of an intent to develop a game whose release date was set two years down the line. Not to mention, one year prior, the only other Walking Dead FPS of note had come out, Survival Instinct. I say of note because it was noted to be one of the worst takes on the franchise ever conceived. While this left a sour spot in the mouths of fans, others remained optimistic. After all, Payday 2 had been a smash hit, and with Overkill at the helm of development, surely their spin on a Walking Dead FPS would be worthwhile, right? Well... Here's the thing, many of the key creative forces behind Payday 2, after its release, had left the company or moved on to other projects. Ulf Anderson apparently stopped coming into work altogether once the highly successful title had dropped. In July of 2014, the game's director David Goldfarb had also stepped down, claiming he was tired of making first-person shooters. This means that even before Walking Dead's announcement, the overkill that would be working on the game wasn't exactly the same as the overkill that released Payday 2. 
Even jumping forward in time a little, Simon Vicland would leave the company in about one year's time to work on his own projects. Now Starbreeze CEO Bo Anderson, on the other hand, had no intentions of leaving, despite his fellow founders of Overkill jumping ship. He had big ideas for Walking Dead, ambitions outreaching even that of the massively successful Payday 2. They were hoping tens of millions of copies would be sold, and that the game would have an actively changing world so that players would keep coming back to see what was new. However, the scope of this kind of game was severely limited by the medium of the engine it was being developed on, the Diesel Engine. Infamous among the Payday 2 community, the Diesel Engine had been in use in some form since the early 2000s. It was originally designed for racing games, such as Ballistics and Flatout. After a while, the engine was modified by its owners at the time, Grin, for use in first-person shooters, such as the Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Advanced Warfighter series, among other titles. Eventually, when Grin became defunct and Overkill rose from its ashes, they used the diesel engine to develop Payday the Heist, and as a result, Payday 2. I'll remind you that a more than 10-year-old engine designed for racing games was the original engine Overkill's The Walking Dead started development on. It was notorious for poor performance, mediocre AI, questionable physics, graphical limitations, and overall limited functionality. The last game to be released for this engine was Raid World War II by Lion Game Lion under Starbreeze, which you all know how that turned out. Rest assured, it wasn't great. Perhaps a topic for another time. You may be asking yourself entirely fairly, why on earth would the developers continue to work in an engine that had long since needed to be replaced? The only reason it had been used up until this point was out of necessity, as prior to Payday 2's release, Overkill wasn't exactly financially stable, let alone successful. Well, many of the developers apparently agreed. I'm going to be heavily referencing a tell-all interview Eurogamer held with anonymous Starbreeze employees, so I've linked that in the description. I'd recommend giving it a read for yourself. This video would not be possible without this article, so give it some support. Development in the diesel engine was slow and limited the programmer's abilities to deliver on the product Starbreeze was promising, an ever-expansive, ever-changing universe with years of continued support. Starbreeze recognized this problem and sought to solve it, but in the same way my uncle once tried to extinguish a man on fire by pouring a cup of scalding coffee over them, their solution solved one problem but created another. In May of 2015, around the same time Starbreeze announced its intention to publish Raid World War II, they also acquired the rights to the Valhalla engine for somewhere around $8 million in shares. It was described by them as, quote, a browser-based AAA game engine that was fully virtual reality ready. It also allowed for randomization of various environmental materials and effects, a mechanic that Overkill used frequently in Payday 2 and would very much like to have in Walking Dead. People were happy to hear that Overkill was finally catching up with the times and ditching the diesel engine at long last, and hopes for the title were even more heavily inflated by a quote from the Walking Dead franchise's creator, Robert Kirkman. Overkill's The Walking Dead is going to be amazing. It's going to blow your minds. I think it's the greatest thing we've done yet in the Walking Dead universe. The only problem with the new Valhalla engine is that it was terrible, borderline non-functional. Quoting both the Eurogame article and thus Starbreeze employees, it was essentially a renderer. There wasn't even a file open button when we got it. It was impossible to use, and this is when it all started to get a bit fucked up. So, to recap, Starbreeze wanted a grand-scale Walking Dead game, and one year before its release date, they swapped it over to a wholly non-functional engine. Meanwhile, Bo Anderson was buying up rights to VR headsets, VR companies, and investments in VR theme parks. Bo was doubling, tripling, and quadrupling down on virtual reality. This was likely the driving force behind the purchase of Valhalla, as it promised VR compatibility despite lacking any compatibility. The developers were Curious, and Starbreeze was dishing out cash faster than they could make it, all for the sake of investing in virtual reality, which meant the burden would fall back on the developers to make VR games as fast as possible to justify the expense. This included VR support for Payday 2, a VR spin-off of Walking Dead, and the critically panned John Wick Chronicles. The developers simply didn't have time to learn how to use a barely functional new engine. In the name of, quote, ensuring the game would be available in Asian markets, Overkill delayed Walking Dead to 2017. 
but having more time to polish a turd doesn't stop it from reeking. Flash forward to April 2017 and barely any progress had been made. The game wasn't playable, let alone releasable. All the while, the developers had been telling Starbreeze that they absolutely had to switch to a proper, widely supported engine. After hearing it enough times, Starbreeze fell into the impression that one last engine switch would be the spell that would magically make all of Walking Dead's problems go away. And that may have even been true had they made their decision years prior. So, after having changed from a barely functional engine to a non-functional engine, Starbreeze purchased a license to use Unreal 4, a widely used and actually functional engine, before delaying the game again to late 2018. This meant that the devs had just one year to compile together everything they had worked on so far, then throw it firmly in the nearest dumpster, as nearly none of the work that had been done up to that point would be salvageable in the Unreal Engine. So now they had one year to develop Walking Dead from scratch on an engine they had never used before, after having spent two years developing on an engine they had never used before. It was chaos, and not just for the developers. Starbreeze, meanwhile, had spent $8 million on digital paperweight. They attempted to save face by claiming Valhalla would be retooled as a plugin for Unreal 4, used for quote, randomization of worlds and dynamically generated gameplay. This still didn't sit well with investors, who at this point were getting cold feet at the prospect of Walking Dead being delayed twice, changing engines twice, and Valhalla being a gigantic waste of time and money. However, for the most part, fans were still excited. Knowing the game wouldn't, in theory anyways, have the same glitches, crashes, and performance problems as Payday 2 was good news. And extraordinarily high-quality CG trailers introducing the game's cast continued to impress. The marketing for the game was mostly working, including several developer streams showcasing select portions of the title and discussing the exciting future of features and content in the game. Starbreeze was going all out on building up hype. Meanwhile, the developers were scrambling. They were using online tutorials on how to develop in the Unreal Engine to try and deliver on their massive game in a year's time. They had ideas for what kind of game they wanted Walking Dead to be, for features, levels, mechanics, and the like that could make the game into what consumers were expecting, given all of the hype being built up from the business side of the company, but they just didn't have time. Starbreeze was still promising a grandiose title. They had live streams and kiosks showing off select portions of what was ready, and kept promising more and more. More levels, more randomization, more story. All the while, the developers were being worked to the bone. They were literally working 100-hour weeks, would stay overnight at the office. There were reports of developers passing out or becoming sick due to exhaustion. Everyone knew Walking Dead was going to bomb, but the game had already been delayed twice. Any further delays likely would have scared off investors and consumers alike. And yet, Starbreeze kept finding ways to shoot themselves and Overkill in their collective foot. In October 2018, one month before the game's slotted release date for PC, they released a closed beta for those who had pre-ordered the game. I have an entire video of my first impressions linked above and below, but rest assured, it was terrible. It ran poorly, played generically, felt sluggish, and lacked lacked basic functionality. There was no control rebinding, no mouse sensitivity slider, the game's display monitor couldn't be changed, the field of view was locked at 70, and open voice chat was permanently enabled. I hesitate to even call the game bad now thinking about it, as that didn't cover the true scale of it. It was a full-on pre-alpha, because Starbreeze didn't give the developers time to prepare a finished product. The publisher backed themselves into a corner by over-promising, over-investing, and waiting too long to change engines, when the developers pointed out that Valhalla wasn't going to work. More betas, including publicly available ones, were introduced over the course of October, and some missing features and issues were addressed. But the core issue wasn't something that could simply be patched out. The game felt bad to play. It was repetitive, sloppy, and unsatisfying. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the developers were stunned they even got a launchable EXE out the door, given the absurd rush job that Starbreeze tasked them with. Finally, in early November 2018, two years after its original intended release date, Overkill's The Walking Dead was fully released on Steam for $60, with console versions planned for early 2019. It was critically panned almost instantly. The game currently sits at a 51% on Metacritic, and I'd love to tell you its rating on Steam, but I'll get to the issue with that momentarily. The best most reviewers could think to say about it was, it can be fun with friends, I guess. Rest assured, it wasn't 
good. The game sorely lacked content to justify its price with only a handful of repetitive maps to play. Unsatisfying stat managing mini games were introduced in a mediocre attempt to pad the game's playtime. It had performance problems, glitches, and crashes abound. I could sit here and explain every reason why Overkill's The Walking Dead is a broken, horrible, unfinished game, but I did that in my review, linked above and below. At this point, if you haven't already, I would highly recommend watching that video before proceeding. The game was both a critical and commercial failure. By the end of 2018, the game barely had over a thousand people playing it and only made three million dollars. Pennies compared to the tens of millions of dollars invested in development, engines, and licensing. Their stock price plummeted, reaching lows as far as nine cents. Starbreeze tried to save face by offering a $30 starter edition which contained all the content in the base game and releasing both paid levels and free levels as bonus content for those with the original $60 title. But these levels, while not bad, simply didn't justify their price points. $8 for a single map is a steep asking price. The new additions weren't enough to attract more buyers and it was clear to investors and consumers alike that Starbreeze was scrambling. But poor sales and reception was not their only problem. Early December 2018, Starbreeze filed for reconstruction in lieu of bankruptcy, and Bo Anderson reportedly resigned. They simply didn't have the funds to keep pretending nothing was wrong, as they had been doing up until then. Between Raid World War II, over-investing into virtual reality, and of course The Walking Dead, they simply gambled away everything they had, over-promised, and waited too long to act when things started going wrong. And this all came to a head not two days later. The Swedish Economic Crime Authority conducted a police raid on Starbreeze, investigating suspicion of insider trading. For those of you who don't know, this is based on the idea of personally profiting off of stock fluctuation based on insider information, i.e. if you know a company's stock value is about to plummet, selling everything you own to make a profit. One person was arrested during the raid. The now former CEO, Bo Anderson, was interviewed around the time of the raid. He responded to nearly all questions regarding if the police were looking for him with variations upon no comment. However, when asked why he left Starbreeze, he responded, quote, I have been fired. This would be a good time to talk about the kind of person Bo Anderson is. Referring back to the Eurogamer article, again it's linked below and worth a read, here are some quotes from Starbreeze employees about the former CEO. He was like this bro macho guy. He was a visionary. He had so many ideas and they sounded cool when he said them, but they were these really big dreams of super triple-A console games that would maybe take between three and five years to develop with a huge team. He's confident and charismatic. When you're talking to him, it's difficult to disagree but he's also very centered around business. It always felt like he was pushing way too hard and way too fast. He was very optimistic about a lot of things that he definitely shouldn't have been. It was very easy to drink his Kool-Aid. He's got this swagger about him, and he'd tell you about how awesome things are and how awesome the tech is. And the problem is, there was never any substance behind any of it. In a lengthy email sent to his former staff the day of his firing, Bo touched on all the great work they'd accomplished, namely Payday 2, and how he wished he could have spent more time developing games rather than working the business side of Starbreeze. There's one paragraph that stands out, and I'll read it verbatim. <clears throat> Personally, though, I lost all my money, my family in divorce, and my kids' custody through the toil over the last two to three years of working 100-hour weeks for Starbreeze and keeping you devs paid and in the game. With less and less developers willing to put in the extra care in a product, it clearly limits the possible results of enough quality in time. This is a new era, and I did not leave the old one and adapt in time. My fault. It's okay. New times. Listen, I'm not gonna sit here and call Bo an asshole. I'm gonna stand up and do it over there. Bo is an asshole! Playing the victim and exclusively blaming the developers for not delivering on your impossible promises, but then trying to write off criticism by saying, I should have realized laziness is the future, sorry for being so productive, fuck off! I'm not saying he single-handedly ruined Overkill's The Walking Dead or drove Starbreeze into the ground, but I think his overreaching, overspending, overpromising, and overworking of staff, developers, and even himself was the biggest factor at play in the collapse of Starbreeze. Granted, not all of their ventures were flops, Payday 2 obviously
previously had quite a bit of staying power and still maintains a cult following. They opened up a VR park in the Dubai Mall with varying titles including spin-offs of Payday and Walking Dead. Dead by Daylight is still maintaining a solid following and frequent updates, although by this point they had started the process of selling the game's rights back to the developer's behavior. Nevertheless, the heavy investment and subsequent failure of Raid World War II just over one year prior gave Star Wars a bad track record of turning projects around. And things don't get better from here. Throughout the first several weeks of January, Walking Dead sales and player base alike were flatlining. The game was dead. No amount of new levels, free or paid, could change that fact. That's not to say the game didn't have fans, and if you're interested in seeing this story from the perspective of content creator who enjoys Overkill's The Walking Dead, you can check out my buddy Sir Crackerbob's video linked above and below. That said, knowing that the game wasn't in a state to be released to any merit of success, it didn't take long for them to announce that the console versions of Walking Dead would be delayed. They had no planned future release date. In early February 2019, in an attempt to recoup costs, Starbreeze sold the rights for System Shock 3 back to its developers, Other Side Entertainment. Needless to say, things weren't looking good, and no company knew that better than Skybound Entertainment. This is Robert Kirkman's publishing company, responsible for all things Walking Dead. If you want to make a Walking Dead licensed product, you have to go through them, be it comics, TV, and of course, video games. And on February 26th, 2019, Skybound announced they would be discontinuing all efforts on Overkill's The Walking Dead. In response to the poor reception, and if we're being honest, likely in light of the tell-all Europe's gamer on Starbreeze, they revoked Starbreeze's license to continue publishing and developing the game. Any consumers who pre-ordered the console versions were issued refunds. A few days later, despite Starbreeze claiming they're in talks to finish releasing their promised Season 2 worth of new content, Overkill's The Walking Dead was taken off of Steam. It can no longer be purchased. The only way to play it now, barring shady key resellers, is if you already owned it to begin with. And this is where our story ends for now. Starbreeze has successfully filed for an extension for their restructuring to avoid bankruptcy. Whether or not new maps will be released for Walking Dead is completely up in the air. The game is still playable on PC for the moment, however, due to it being online only, that could change should Skybound decide it to. All it would take is to disconnect The Walking Dead from Steamworks, and the game would become completely extinct. So, his Overkill's The Walking Dead the worst game to ever use Robert Kirkman's IP? Absolutely not. I think most people would agree that Survival Instinct takes that trophy handily. Does it deserve a second chance? Personally, I don't think so. At least not with Starbreeze at the helm. Should Skybound have pulled the license? Well, I guess that's debatable. Personally, I understand that they were trying to save face, especially with allegations of insider trading and overworking at Starbreeze running rampant. But if they were gonna revoke the IP, they should have done it far sooner. Pulling the rug out from under developers in the middle of them trying to make new content and make the game just a little bit better, all it does is make a messy story even messier. Well, what's gonna happen to everyone involved next? I certainly don't think the Walking Dead IP is going anywhere anytime soon, so Kirkman and Skybound will likely make it out of this unscathed. Bo Anderson was cleared of any wrongdoing in early 2019, but is no longer associated with Starbreeze. His brother, Ulf Anderson, along with Simon Vickland, went on to find their own studio called Ten Chambers, and are working on their own shooter called GTFO. As for the future of Payday, Overkill, and Starbreeze, well... I'd hesitate to think optimistically. If Starbreeze can't somehow turn a profit in one way or another soon, they'll go bankrupt, meaning the future of their beloved franchises is a befuddled mess. I'd like to thank some people for helping me out on this project. Sir Crackerbulb for fact-checking and tracking down resources, Peacemaker for helping me record footage, Arikado Zodin for purchasing the game for me in the first place, and all of you for watching. If you're looking to keep up with my other works in the future, you could follow me on Twitter at the link below. Regardless, I hope you all have a good day, and take it easy.